a couple of videos ago, I started a series on 20 things, 20 wealth secrets that'll make you rich in your 20s. And um, they're based on the four levels of value, implementation being the lowest level of value, then com unification being the second level, and then communication being the third level, and imagination being the highest level. Um, we're doing five different secrets for each level of value. And so we've already done, we started at the top with imagination and then we did communication. Now we're going to do unification. And, and this is one of the most important components of success in general is unification. And when I say unification, people don't know what I mean because when I say unification, I'm talking about the four levels of value. I often talk about management skills. But when I talk about unification, I'm talking about congruency. I'm talking about alignment. I'm talking about, I'm talking about not having internal conflicts and not having external conflicts, like things working in harmony. I'm talking about like harmony and symphony. I'm not, I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about managing a bunch of people to do a bunch of things. You also have to manage yourself to do a bunch of things. You also have to manage yourself and you have to manage your emotion and you have to manage your aspirations and all of this other stuff. And so this whole thing about being congruent, congruent is very, very important even from a biblical perspective, because the scripture tells us in James chapter one, it says, um, if any of you lack wisdom, lay mask of God who giveth all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And then it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. In other words, like ask with faith and no doubt, ask in faith and no doubt, no doubt at all. Not, not a little bit of doubt, not a lot of doubt, it says, but let him ask in faith. It's, 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 like, it's like the guy that prayed, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. This is, this, is, this is not that. Fear not, only believe, right? And he said, see, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the winds and is tossed. And then it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's, that's a lot of instability. You're unstable in all your ways? Like, Everything's unstable. When you're double-minded, everything in your life is unstable. Your family's unstable. Your friendships are unstable. Your finances are unstable. Your fitness is unstable because you're double-minded. You can't make up your mind. So you're attempting to go in two directions at the same time. So when I talk about unification, I'm not just talking about managing people. I'm talking about unification of passion and purpose. I'm talking about unification of desire and expectation. And so we have to have this, this high level of unification and because if you go around, and here's what a lot of people do. This, this is one of the reasons why I'm not terribly crazy about affir affirmations as a strategy for achievement. I do like affirmations as a strategy for changing your perspective, but I don't like affirmations as a strategy. Like, I'm just gonna affirm this thing and I'm gonna keep saying it over and over and it's gonna eventually become true. Well, not if you don't believe it, it's not. Because if you're saying, oh, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and you have z like next to zero internal belief that you are going to achieve X, Y, Z, it's, it's, not the, it's not just the lack of belief that's keeping you from having it. It is the incongruency that comes, the, it's the disparity between the words that you're saying and the belief that you're carrying, and that disparity is creating instability that won't let you build anything substantive on top of it. When you're in your 20s, this is for anybody in any age, but like, I could have done a lot of the things I'm doing now in my 20s. And, and, and some people say, when they ask me, if you could do, if you could go back and talk to your 20 year old self, what would you say? And when they ask me that question in a business context, I would say, you're gonna get rich, do it sooner rather than later, because the sooner you get it done, the longer you get to enjoy it with the people you love the most. Even though that's what I would have told my 20 year old self, there is, a, there is an aspect of me that's glad my 20 year old self did not understand that. You say, how could you, there be an aspect of you that's glad your 20 year old self didn't understand that? Well, because had I understood it when I was 20, I would not have had to learn a lot of the lessons I had to learn in order to know what I know now if I had known it when I was 20. And so it's, it's like the valley of all of the difficulty that we face when we're younger and don't know the answers are, that's the place where God prepares us for what he has prepared for us. And so we have to realize that, yeah, I would have liked to have gotten it done sooner, but the fact that I didn't contributed to who I am and where I am now. So even though I didn't max out my potential in my 20s, I have so much to be grateful for as a result of not having done that. So I think I'm telling you that so that those of you who are in your 30s, 40s, and 50s don't beat yourself up because you didn't know it in your 20s. So five secrets for unification so that I can become more congruent, so that I can achieve stability in these areas of my life in which I'm working. 
The first thing I'm going to say is this. Get in alignment with your assignment. What does that mean? Well, you were created for a purpose. We all were. And the one who created you is the one who determined your purpose, not you. Like, I don't get to determine my purpose. I get to discover my purpose. I get to develop myself for that purpose. I get to deploy myself in that purpose, but I don't get to decide that purpose. Are y'all tracking? Because God made me for what he made me for. And he didn't make me for what he made you for. And he didn't make you for what he made me for. And that's why I don't have to be jealous of you. And you don't have to be jealous of me. Because we all have our own assignment. And so God has this umbrella of authority and protection and authority. And then we are under that. An umbrella of authority and protection. And as long as I'm under God's authority and I'm in alignment with my assignment, then I get to rule over an assignment that's under my authority and protection. And as long as I'm yielded to God's sovereign, sovereignty in my assignment, my assignment has to be yielded to me. And when I get out from under God's umbrella of authority and protection, then my assignment is no longer under me because my assignment's going to stay under God, whether I do or not. And so when I resist the assignment that God created me for, I'm resisting my purpose, I'm resisting my fulfillment, I'm resisting my profitability, I'm resisting my success, because the actual definition of success is to discover the purpose for which we were created, develop ourselves for that purpose, deploy yourself in that purpose, and if you do something else, you're not successful. You may make a lot of money, but you're not successful. You may be a high achiever in an arena that is not your own, but you are not successful. So you have to first get in alignment with your assignment, and that begins with discovering your assignment. Now, the question then becomes, how do I discover my assignment? Well, I wish I had some help in here. So how, so, so how, do, I, where, how do I discover my assignment? I discover my assignment first and foremost by yielding to the God who created me before I know what the assignment is. Because God's not in the business of negotiating with, negotiating with humans. And so, tell you what, God, if you tell me what my assignment is and I like it, I'll do it. <clears throat> Wrong answer, but we do have some nice consolation prizes for you in the back. That's not how this works. This ain't that. And so, instead, instead of, instead of negotiating, just like yield, okay, I want my life to be whatever God created it to be. And if that means that I am going to reign like King David and kill giants, let's go. And if it means I'm going to rule in prosperity and wisdom like King Solomon, let's go. But if it means I'm going to be Ezekiel, and I'm gonna to have to lay on my side for hundreds of days and not get up to eat, drink, or go to the bathroom for, as a sermon illustration that God already told me nobody's gonna repent over, sign me up. That's what I mean when I say yield to your assignment before you know what it is. That means if you are, like, like I read the book of Ezekiel when I was a teenager. And I was like, wow, can I be really, really transparent? My thought was, and I don't know that it's changed much. Wow, I'm glad I didn't have his assignment. <laughs> God came to Ezekiel. He said, hey, you know that pretty little wife you got? Yeah, she's going to die tonight. But tomorrow, don't mourn. Because I want to show Israel that I'm not going to mourn when I cut them off. Oh, and by the way, nobody's going to repent. What? See, this whole, this whole, this whole God is a genie and a lamp and the lamp is the Bible nonsense. I'm just going to rub my Bible and like God's going to give me what I want. That's, that, there's, that is not biblical. God is not my employee. He's not my genie. Okay. <laughs> I hate false doctrine so much because it leads people down so many bad paths and then they end up getting mad at God for something some idiotic human made up and said that God said it when God never said it in the first place. Get in alignment with your assignment and then realize that boundaries build bonds that create freedom. What does that even mean? If my front door is unlocked and somebody comes walking in, what kind of greeting they're going to get when they walk across that boundary is determined by who they are. Right? Because that boundary is not just a boundary around my house. That boundary is a boundary around my family. So if the front door opens and my daughter walks in with my granddaughter, they get a very different greeting. Then some joker walks in there talking about, yeah, just, uh, you know, we just came to rob you. Okay. Good luck with that. That's going to be a different greeting. Right? Y'all, I, I consider y'all, do y'all consider me to be a friend? I consider y'all to be friends, right? If I came to your house, and I knocked on the door, and you opened the door, and you saw it was me, what would you say? Hi, come in, right? 
But what if you heard some noise in the kitchen at four o'clock in the morning? And you come down there and I got head and shoulders in the window climbing in your house. Am I going to get a different greeting? It's a totally different greeting. Why? Because boundaries are what create bonds. Boundaries, like you can't have, you cannot have freedom without boundaries. It's interesting that Romans chapter seven really deals with this so beautifully because it teaches us that freedom from anything is bondage to its opposite. Did did I say that too fast? See, here's 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 what Romans chapter seven says. It says, to be free from sin is to be bound by righteousness. To be free from righteousness is to be bound by sin. All freedom is a form of bondage and all bondage is a form of freedom. (laughs) You just got to pick which one you want, which side side of that equation you want. You cannot have freedom without boundaries. Do you understand why we were able to drive here in the cars today? Because there are these little lines down the middle of the road called boundaries. We don't call them boundaries, but that's what they are. And they're called boundaries. And here's what they mean. You stay on your side. I'm going to stay on my side. You cannot have freedom without boundaries. That's one of the reasons why these people that don't understand, like you have to have, if you're going to have a country, you have to have a legal way for people to enter the country or you lose control of your, you you, you have no more freedom. And people who don't understand that are delusional because freedom can only exist inside of boundaries. So if we're going to be unified, we have to have boundaries. We, ha- we have to have boundaries. We have to have boundaries for ourselves. There have to be lines that we won't cross. We have, have to have boundaries in our relationships. We have to have boundaries in our finances. It, it's, it's so interesting how people make decisions, make bad decisions as if boundaries don't exist. And then when they suffer the consequence of the trespass, because that's what trespass means, right? The word, the, re- the, word, the word trespass means to cross over the line. And then they're shocked. How are you shocked? So boundaries build bonds that are based on freedom. Congruence creates connection. So one of the things that I've got, I, it's, it's so interesting because as I'm taking my guitar lessons, right? And when my guitar teacher gives me an assignment, something to practice, and I first start doing it, it's like, well, this is so unnatural. Well, let's start with this. Playing a musical instrument is really pretty unnatural. Like sports is kind of unnatural. Like Golf is really unnatural. It's like the most unnatural of unnaturals. Um, But it's also the most magnificent of magnificent sports. Um, But anyway, like playing a guitar is unnatural. And I remember the first time I ever saw somebody play a guitar, like play a guitar, like they were changing chords. I thought, how do they move their fingers that fast? Like how do they get their fingers there in time to play the chords? Did anybody else ever wonder that? And it seemed impossible until I learned how to do it. And I was like, oh, it wasn't impossible. It was just a little challenging because I hadn't yet prepared myself to do it. Okay, so, so like there's some times you have to put your fingers in some really, really contorted ways in order to, and, and what's happening is you're, you're setting up a neural pathway between your brain and your body. You're creating this connection. But One of the things that I discovered that destroys the congruence that a lot of people have is when they look at something they desire to accomplish or they look at some activity they desire to participate in, they assign a level of difficulty to that activity before they even endeavor to do it. And that that literally inhibits your ability to create congruence in that arena. So, So what happens is when you assign a level of difficulty, now you're attempting to do it believing that it's hard, and the only thing, and it may be hard, but it doesn't help you to decide that it's hard before you do it. So if you say, okay, yeah, this is a little challenging, but it's not more challenging than I am champion. Yeah, it's a little difficult, but it's not more difficult than I am determined. If you approach it like that, then it doesn't matter how hard anything is. Because there's really nothing you can't do. You realize that, right? Okay, there's, like, I mean, within within, like, there's so many, here's what I'm going to say. I'll say it a different way. There's nothing you can't do. There are so many things we do today that seemed impossible only 50 years ago. So many more things we do today that seemed impossible 100 years ago, even more 200 years ago. 
Like some stuff we do today with our phones and air travel, man, you'd have been burnt, to, burnt at the stake 150 years ago, walking around with a cell phone, looking at, <laughs> he put those people in that little thing in his hand, right? They, they, <laughs> they wouldn't even get it. And so my challenge to you is like, be congruently connected to who God says you are and then and only then can you be congruently connected to what God says you can do. And when God said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, when he said subdue it, subdue means to trample. And if God's, te- and what, why, so be fruitful means to produce on the outside based on what God put on the inside. Multiply means to increase. Replenish means to fill up the earth with the stuff you've increased. And then uh, uh, subdue means to stomp or to trample. That one doesn't seem to fit, does it? Except... God's showing us a pattern. Everybody say pattern. Pattern. Showing us a pattern. What's the pattern? Disruption always follows intention. I was thinking about this last night um, when I was laying in bed and my arm wouldn't move and my toe felt like it was going to explode. And I'm laying there thinking, I just started this workout program. Now I can't move my stupid arm. Oh, this must be the perfect workout program for me because disruption always follows intention. You see the difference? As opposed to saying, no, you know, I, I knew I was too old to exercise. <laughs> That's what I would have liked to say. I would have loved to have said that. Oh, yeah, yeah, old people ain't supposed to exercise. No, we ain't supposed to do that. Right? <laughs> but I I, that's not the conclusion I came to. Okay, this is the exercise program for me because on my first day, I literally get my assignment last night and torture myself. Okay, so... So, so we have to develop this level of congruence. It's interesting. I, 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 was, I, went, I bought this machine that retrains the nervous system and strengthens muscle. And does all, it, it strengthens the signal between your brain and your body. It's electronic muscle, stimul- muscle and nerve stimulation machine. Well, this machine was like $18,000 a couple years ago. It's probably $25,000 now. And, but when I bought it, I went to a five-day training to learn how to use it. Like five days, all day for five days. And other than two other people, everybody in the room was a doctor. Me and two other people and everybody else were doctors. Okay, so so, so I was talking to the guy, Garrett, the guy who was training us on this machine. I was like, yeah, man, I don't know, man. I just can't, I can't, I don't, I'm losing distance and my golf shots are running. He's like, he's like, okay, let me ask you a question. He said, what do you think your brain is more interested in? you being able to hit a 300-yard drive with your driver or not hurting yourself? Not hurting myself, right. He said, your brain will automatically restrict some movements if it knows that if you pull that movement off, you're going to hurt yourself. That's why athletes, sometimes they are in a zone and sometimes they're not. Like, sometimes they just can't pull it off. Like, sometimes, even in your sport, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? In your sport, sometimes it just doesn't work. I'm like, I, I, I was able to do this yesterday, or I was able to do this last week. Right. But you were in a, but maybe you slept on your arm wrong, right? And, or maybe you twisted your neck or had too many pillows or something, and now your body's like, no, you can't do that move today, right? Proprioception is the ability to know where you are in space and be able to move your body in a particular way. And sometimes your brain will just restrict it and put you on lockdown and won't let you make those moves. Well, I'm telling you that your belief in your ability to achieve a thing is one of those mechanism that, mechanisms that frees you up to do it. Your lack of ability to believe that you are able to do the thing is one of the things that keeps you from doing it. Like, you have to become hyper-obsessive about being congruent. Like, and, and th- I know this is not the most exciting topic in the world, but, I, like, I don't like people planting word seeds in my brain that I don't want to reap a harvest for, right? Because every, every deed is a seed, every word is a seed, every thought is a seed, every dollar is a seed that I'm sowing into the garden of my future. So sometimes people will say things to you because based on their belief, and if you don't verbally reject it, and maybe this isn't true, but for me, it feels like it's true. Is that transparent enough? Yeah. If I don't verbally reject it, I feel like I'm going to allow that seed to take root in my brain and I ain't having it. So if somebody says to me, Myron, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be, I don't worry. And I literally will say that. I don't worry. In fact, it's been so long since I've worried, I've forgotten how to do it. I will almost always say that when somebody says to me, don't worry. Why? Because, I'm, because you worry, I'm not going to let you assume that I worry. Right, right. 
And I'm not going to accept it. No. Oh, oh, no, Myron, it's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay. Did I look concerned? You, you say what I'm saying. Like, you have to be very, very hyper-intentional to protect your mind from ideas that are subversive. That's why the scripture says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. What does that mean? That means you have to guard your heart with all diligence for what you let into your heart comes out of your life. Once you let it in your heart, you can't stop it from producing a fruit, but you can stop it from getting in there in the first place. So it says, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Um, and then it says, um, um, put away from thee a froward mouth, perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before you. Ponder the paths of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. He's telling us you have to protect your heart. You have to protect your sound gate and your sight gate and your schedule gate and your standard gate from allowing things in that are going to produce fruit that are going to destroy your life. So um, decisions determine direction. Some people are very, very bad at making decisions and they have very, very weak decision-making muscles because they don't ever make decisions. They just make choices. And you can tell because they're like a fish on the sidewalk in Florida in July. They're just flip-flopping all the time. Flip-flop, 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 flip-flop because they don't know how to make a decision. And when you make a decision, the word decide, de, of or from, side to cut, you cut yourself off from any other possibility. And that's what determines the direction that you go, making real decisions. Stop choosing and start deciding. Say, Myron, what do you mean stop choosing and start deciding? Choose, choose. Here's what choose means. Pick one. But if you pick one today, you might pick a totally different one tomorrow. But when you decide, it's a wrap. How many of y'all are tracking? Like, I decided... I decided a long time ago, when I first started developing a level of abundance and wealth in my life, I felt really, really guilty. I'm just really going to be like, I felt, I felt like, I didn't feel guilty like I wanted to give it back. I didn't feel that guilty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> I wasn't crazy. I wasn't crazy or delusional, but but I felt like, wow, like I see all these people working like three-legged mules all around me and I'm not really working that hard. And I remember I was making 30,000 a month and I'm thinking, I'm making 30,000 a month. They're barely making 30,000 a year and they're working way harder than me. I'm just working on different stuff. And I thought, you know, I used to give away money just because I felt bad that I had so much more than other people. I don't do that anymore. I don't apologize for being rich. Like, I don't justify being, like, you say, well, yeah, our business makes a lot of money, but we give to blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing that. Why? Because it's not necessary. I don't have to justify why I brush my teeth. You already know why. If I don't, my breath is going to be bad. My teeth are going to rot out of my head. Right. right? I don't have to justify. Like, we act like we, oh, because we bought into the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism's lie, Wealth is wickedness and poverty is piety. We feel like we have to apologize for being rich. I'm not, I just don't do it anymore. I don't, I don't rationalize it. I don't justify it. It just is the byproduct of the assignment that I'm on and the people I serve. It is what it is. I'm not going to apologize for it. And so you have to make some decisions. I, like There are business decisions that I have made. Like I don't want everybody buying my coaching programs. There are some people, I just don't want them, I don't want them in my coaching programs. So you know what I do? I make sure everybody knows who I am up front. Yes, I teach business based on biblical principles. I'm not going to back in the door. I don't want business so bad that I'm going to act like I believe something I don't believe or act like I don't believe something I do believe. I'm not going to go along to get along. I'm not going to let some politically correct, morally incorrect tool back me into a corner with a bunch of goofball questions that are self-contradictory in the end anyway and feel like, oh, 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 oh. I remember when um, a certain evangelical pastor was on Larry King Live and he asked him if he believed that homosexual, the Bible taught that homosexuality was wrong. And he said, oh, duh, duh. this is the only time I've ever seen this guy uncomfortable in my life. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? That's an easy answer. Yeah. Yeah. I believe the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. The Bible says Adultery is wrong. The Bible says fornication is wrong. Like, drunkenness is wrong. Yeah. And just because I say that those things are wrong doesn't mean I hate those people. That means it's wrong. 
Why is it wrong? Because God said so. And if that's not the reason, there is no reason. You say, you say, Myron, what's your point? Well, if that, if that, if Larry King would have asked me that, I would have said, let me ask you a question, Mr. King. And then I'll answer your question when you answer mine. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and the only way a person can have eternal life? What do you think Larry King would have said to that? No, I don't believe that. Okay, then I, would, then I would have asked him this question. If I don't need you to believe what I believe in order for me to believe it, why do you need me to believe what you believe in order for you to believe it? Could it be the reason you're attempting to pressure me into a politically correct answer is because you already know in your heart of hearts that what you say you believe is wrong? See, what happens is when, when these politically correct, morally incorrect tools attempt to put us on the back foot, we capitulate and retreat instead of going on the offense. But see, I was reading the Bible, and when Goliath, who, by the way, wanted to enslave God's people, that's what he said, if I win, you be our slaves, if, we win, if you win, we'll be yours. He wanted to enslave God's people. Everybody else ran from Goliath. David ran toward him. David didn't go on the defense against Goliath. David went on the offense against Goliath. Okay, anyway, just wondering if anybody's picking up what I'm putting down. The last thing I'm going to say is this. Exclusion elevates excellence. What does that mean? I say this all the time as I'm coaching people. Anything that's for everybody is also for nobody. Oh, my product's good for everybody. Oh, my service is good for everybody. Oh, my business is good for everybody. Well, if you are delusional enough to believe that, then I am smart enough to know I don't need to buy anything from you. Guess what? Neiman Marcus knows they don't want Walmart's customers. Walmart knows they don't want Neiman Marcus's customers. Why? Because they understand that anything that's good for everybody is also good for nobody. Exclusion elevates excellence. You have to determine who you're going to serve and how you're going to serve them. And whatever that answer is, it can't be everybody. Now, here's what I, when I say that, like, I believe it's my responsibility to serve every human being I come across. But it's not my responsibility to serve every human being I come across in business. There are some people in business that I just need to leave them alone and they need to leave me alone. So we can both be happy, right? But that's not going to happen if I'm a chameleon and I'm attempting to appeal to everybody because I want the money. The money is the byproduct. Like, I... The money is not, like, I like being rich. It's way better than being poor. I've been both. And I was poor for longer than I was rich, but fortunately, I got richer than I was poor when I was poor. <laughs> and I like being rich. But I don't love the money the most. I love the people. The money's just the byproduct. The money is the tool. The money is the gravy. It's not the mashed potatoes. It's the icing. It's not the cake. It's the bonus. It's not the salary. Living in your purpose, that's the real paycheck. And in order to do that, you can't have something that's for everyone. It can't be for everyone. You have to decide who you're going to help, how you're going to help them. And when you do that, when you apply this level of alignment and congruency and unification to your life, in your 20s, along with the communication and the imagination, and then the next video will be on implementation. When you do that, it'll take your life to a level that you previously could not have imagined. Like 10 years ago, I had absolutely zero conceptual idea that a life as good as the one I'm living now even existed, let alone that it would be mine. And so apply these principles, get in alignment with your assignment, set up some boundaries, develop some congruence, become decisive, and operate from a position of exclusional excellence. We're doing our challenge this week. There's a guy, he came on yesterday between the, general, between the VIP experience and the, and the general admission. He said, he said, man, we've been thinking about this $60,000 offer for our clients for months now. And I just, I was, I was like nervous about pulling the trigger. And after listening to Myron on Monday, I said, I'm just going to do it. Just, we put out the $60,000 offer. In less than 30 minutes, somebody bought it. And this was the testimony he gave yesterday. He said in the first three days, we sold six of them. He brought in an extra $360,000 because he became unified. And he stopped being a double-minded man in the arena of his pricing. I hope this blesses you. In the meantime, in between time, stay blessed by the best. And we'll see you on the next video. Bye for now.